this is a, like I said, this is Kim Hutchinson, so I'm the executive director of the Virginia Farmers Market Association. And I appreciate all of you joining us today for our webinar on industrial hemp. We, um, the Virginia Farmers Market Association is a statewide organization that works with farmers, uh, vendors at farmers markets and farmers market managers in order to provide tools and resources to make sure that all of Virginia's farmers markets are sustainable. We held a webinar on hemp at our conference. We graciously um, had the, the pleasure of having Kyle Shreve present at our statewide association conference a couple of weeks ago, and there was overwhelming interest in, in uh, feedback from his session. We did not give him enough time, unfortunately, based on all the feedback, and we asked him if he would please come and talk in greater detail um, to folks in Virginia that have an interest in hemp and how it can, uh, all the, the regulations, et cetera, both on the farm and using the product at farmer's market. So um, I am going to um, turn the session over to our two speakers today. Kyle Shreve is the executive director of the Virginia Agribusiness Council, and Aaron Williams with VDAX is the senior policy analyst um, in the Office of Policy Planning and Research for the Virginia Department of Agricultural Services here in Virginia. So, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over, and please unmute yourself if you have a question and or use the chat function, and then Kyle and Aaron will also have an opportunity for you to um, ask questions um, after their presentation. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Chris. I'm going to actually go ahead and let Erin go first. Uh, she'll give the regulatory background and everything, and then I'll, I'll wrap it up with some of our um, legislative and regulatory efforts from, from the council's point of view. Perfect. Thank you, Erin. All right. Good morning. Thank you for the invitation to present to um, the Virginia Farmers Market Association. I am, um, give me a second, I'll pull up my presentation. Um, I. Um, as Ken said, I'm in the Office of Policy Planning and Research at the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, and I have been coordinating the agency's efforts to implement the Virginia Industrial Hemp Law since it was enacted back in 2015. Um, what I'll do today um, is kind of give you an overview of where we are with federal and state law as it pertains to hemp production. Um, I, I will go over the recently published um, interim final rule on hemp production from the U.S. Department of Agriculture and tell you a little bit about where we are with the Virginia plan in response to USDA's final rule. And then I'll um, touch a little bit on food safety and what VDAX is doing um, with regards to industrial hemp processors who may um, need to be uh, <coughs> under inspection by VDAX's food safety program. Um, for the purposes of my presentation, I, um, you, I may use the term hemp and industrial hemp, both terms. I don't mean to make any distinction between the two. For me, as far as um, industrial hemp and hemp are both cannabis with no more than 0.3% THC. Um, the uh, distinction in the law between industrial hemp and marijuana is that THC concentration. And again, by law, anything over 0.3% THC or any cannabis over 0.3% THC is marijuana. The 2014 um, federal farm bill kind of, kind of restarted hemp production in the U.S. Um, and the farm bill defined hemp as cannabis sativa um, with a THC THC concentration of not more than 0.3%. So that's where that 3% originated. Um, Virginia's law um, adopts the federal THC limit um, by reference. Um, the the 0.3 um, remains in the law today. So the 2014 Farm Bill said that you could grow hemp um, in the U.S. if you grew it for research purposes in a state that had uh, a law that allowed for it to be grown for research purposes. Um, following the enactment of the Farm Bill, the Virginia, Industrial, the Virginia Industrial Hemp Law was enacted by the 2015 session of Virginia's General Assembly, and it created a research program that was overseen by the Commissioner of Agriculture and Consumer Services, 
um, but managed directly by public institutions of higher education. And we have four um, universities that were conducting um, hemp research programs under um, that initial law, um, Virginia Tech, uh, Virginia State University, James Madison University, and the University of Virginia all had hemp research programs under um, the research program requirements and in the industrial hemp law. They continue to do hemp research today. Um, back in 2015, the original law um, allowed an individual to possess industrial hemp if that person had a license to grow hemp for research purposes, and VDAX um, is re was responsible for issuing those um, licenses. The law was, um, the Virginia law was changed in 2018 to create a second research program that was to be directly managed by VDAX and um, to transition from a licensure program to a grower registration program. In 2018, the background check requirement for uh, an industrial hemp registration was um, eliminated. The, um, those amendments became effective in July of 2018, but by December of 2018, the federal government signed the, or passed the, the federal farm bill that Kind of rewrote the landscape for hemp in the U.S. The 2018 federal farm bill, which was signed in December of 2018, established a new definition of hemp. Um, it and to clarify that the cannabinoids of um, the hemp plant were to be considered hemp. Um, the farm bill removed hemp from the definition of marijuana in the Federal Controlled Substance Act, and it established a regulatory framework for the commercial production of hemp in the U.S. Um, the Farm Bill provided that um, states that want to have primary regulatory authority over hemp production um, could submit a plan to USDA for approval. It also, Farm Bill also requires USDA to come up with its own regulatory program so that uh, growers in states that don't have approved plans can grow under USDA plans. So I'll get into more detail about what USDA's regulations look like in just a minute, but again, that the framework for the regulation that we're all talking about um, recently um, is outlined in the Farm Bill. The Farm Bill also provides that crop insurance and certain U.S. Department of Agriculture programs and grants are available for um, hemp farmers. The president signed the Farm Bill, um, again, at the end of December 2018, which was in time for Virginia's General Assembly to respond to the 2018 Farm Bill. And in, during the 2019 session of Virginia's General Assembly, um, Delegate Marshall and Senator Ruff had um, pieces, pieces of companion legislation that amended Virginia's industrial hemp law to reflect the t many of the provisions in the 2018 Farm Bill, namely that the legislation here in Virginia eliminated the industrial hemp research program, um, essentially allowing for commercial production of hemp in Virginia. The legislation had an emergency clause on it, which meant that rather than waiting until July 1 to become effective, like most pieces of legislation are, um, the emergency clause meant that when the day that Governor Northam signed the legislation, um, the bills went into effect. The idea was that this, we could have, with an emergency clause, um, we could have commercial production and hemp production in Virginia in um, 2019. So the um, 2019 legislation retained that grower registration, uh, retained the processor registration, and created a hemp dealer registration. The dealer registration category is one for an entity that is buying crop from industrial hemp growers and selling the crop to processors. Um, the dealer is essentially a middleman between the growers and processors. Um, you do not have to work with a dealer, but um, it's, it's an option. It's a, a role that exists in the tobacco industry, and there was some desire to um, create that role within the industrial hemp industry here in Virginia. Um, the legislation from 2019 here in Virginia also provided authority for the Commissioner of Agriculture to enter into corrective action plans to address negligent violations of the industrial hemp law. And that's language that appeared in the Farm Bill. 
Um, so we were able to get that put into Virginia's industrial hemp law um, with the hopes that that will help us have a successful plan um, under review by USDA. The legislation retained the requirement that for um, hemp to be excluded from the definition of marijuana in Virginia's Drug Control Act and Virginia's criminal code, that hemp must be in the possession of somebody registered under the industrial hemp law or that person's agent. Um, so this is the um, provision that um, there was a lot of some discussion about during during session, there was an attempt to, initially an attempt to remove the, the condition that hemp be possessed by somebody registered under the industrial hemp law um, so that anyone could have plant material, essentially. Um, but as a re the discussion kind of revolved around the, the cost to law enforcement, the, f the fiscal um, impact to law enforcement and their laboratories for anybody to be able to possess um, industrial hemp without a registration. So um, as a result, the, um, the condition that has existed for um, years was retained. Um, however, the legislation did provide that a hemp product that has no more than 0.3% THC um, that's derived from hemp, that's a finished product and otherwise compliant with the law, um, is not marijuana and can be possessed by anybody. The legislation also went to clear up some issues that we were having with hemp-derived CBD oil, um, and it clarified that hemp-derived oil is not cannabidiol oil as that term is defined in the Drug Control Act. Drug Control Act cannabidiol oil is a specific product produced by entities that are um, regulated by Virginia's Board of Pharmacy. Um, so, Again, the legislation has cleared up the issue that a hemp-derived oil is not cannabidiol oil and can be produced by somebody outside of the Board of Pharmacy's um, uh, registration, pro the Board of Pharmacy's regulation, and can be possessed by anyone, not, um, not limited to the, ent the individual to have registered with the Board of Pharmacy. However, there was a lot of discussion during the 2019 session about um, the quality of um, hemp-derived CBD oils, um, questions about the, um, uh, whether they're produced under good facilities that are maintained under good manufacturing practices, whether there would be um, confusion between the Board of Pharmacy cannabidiol oil product and a hemp-derived oil product. Um, the result of the discussion from the 2019 session was that the Secretary of Agriculture and Forestry and the Secretary of Health and Human Resources would report to the General Assembly by November 1 um, on appropriate standards for the production of a hemp-derived oil or an, an oil containing a hemp-derived extract. That report has been published. The Secretary did find that standards are appropriate for hemp-derived oil. Um, the, that are intended for human consumption, um, and the secretaries have kind of outlined some suggested legislation to um, and suggested regulatory um, pieces to establish standards for um, hemp-derived oils that are intended for, for human consumption. Um, the um, recommendations are um, to be used as education for the General Assembly as they, or this, this upcoming session of the General Assembly uh, as they continue to debate hemp derived extracts and um, the regulation thereof. So the, again, the legislation had an emergency clause. The governor signed it on March 21st. It became effective March 21st. Um, by April, uh, VDAX had implemented the new program, so removed all of the research pieces to um, the hemp program. And as of December 6th, we have registered 1,235 industrial hemp growers. Um, 2019, again, was the first season of commercial hemp production here in Virginia. And based on the planting reports that we received from registered hemp growers, um, they planted about 2,200 
acres in industrial hemp here in Virginia this growing season. So I will um, kind of walk through the, an outline of USDA's interim final rule for domestic hemp production um, and kind of give you my um, take on how Virginia falls or where Virginia is um, with um, respect to the requirements that USDA has. So this interim final rule that USDA published at the end of October has a section that um, is basically for states that want primary regulatory authority over hemp production. And then there's another section for growers who, have, who will be regulated by the U.S. Department of Agriculture because they are growing in a state that doesn't have a USDA-approved plan. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is just the section that pertains to states that want to have primary regulatory authority over hemp production. So USDA is requiring um, that um, USDA took the outline that the Farm Bill provides for what areas need to be regulated um, for hemp production and kind of um, provided some additional requirements and some additional details for states to consider as they regulate hemp production. So the first um, procedure that a state needs to tell USDA about in its plan is that uh, the state's procedure for collecting and reporting information to the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture. Um, this is essentially the state, how the state um, We'll collect information from growers and we'll know where growers are growing hemp in the state. Um, USDA calls on states to collect information on key participants of business entities that are um, uh, registered growers. Um, so that will look a little bit different here in Virginia under a USDA approved plan. We don't cu currently collect information on the key participants, where, which are essentially the executive management of any business. Um, so we will, um, once we get a USDA approved plan, we'll need to begin collecting that information. USDA also expects states to review the criminal history records for all applicants and um, key participants of, um, for grower registrations. So that's another piece that's going to look different um, potentially in 2020 um, should we get a USDA approved plan. USDA also asks for states to outline its procedure for accurate and effective sampling. USDA requires that states sample all crops, hemp crops grown in the state, and that the samples be collected within the 15 days prior to harvest. Uh, states also have to have a procedure to ensure that no harvest is done before the crop is sampled. So that um, will look different in Virginia in 2020. This, in 2019, we used a risk-based system to um, select the growers we were going to sample. We did not sample everyone. Pre-harvest sampling wasn't required, but under um, USDA's regulations, it appears that um, pre-harvest sampling will be required. USDA's rule also requires states to lay out its procedure for testing. USDA is clear that states must measure um, the total available THC or total THC of the crop. Um, states have to provide a measurement of uncertainty on their um, lab analysis reports. Um, the measurement of uncertainty will is to be used by the state to determine whether the crop is compliant. So essentially, um, the measurement of uncertainty will set a range, and if the crop um, from which the state is called to determine whether there's an acceptable level of um, THC in that crop. Um, Virginia has, since 2016, used gas chromatography to test the total THC of the hemp crops grown in Virginia, so that's not going to look um, any different under a USDA approved plan for 2020. Um, we, uh, states are also called on by USDA to um, establish a procedure for notifying USDA and um, for disposing of plants that don't meet the definition of hemp. Um, USDA requires that anything that's um, 
any crop that's hot has to be disposed of in accordance with the Federal Controlled Substance Act and with DEA regulations. Um, we, I'm hopeful that DEA will put out some guidance as to how states are to um, help growers um, respond to that requirement that they um, destroy hot crops in um, accordance with DEA regulations, but um, I expect that that will be forthcoming. USDA also requires states to establish a procedure for enforcement. Um, a lot of this section of the, the regulation reflects um, provisions that are, were in the Farm Bill and that Virginia put into the industrial hemp law. So there are um, specific violations named in USDA's rule, um, including failing to provide a description of the land where hemp is grown, failing to obtain authorization to grow, and then producing a crop that exceeds the acceptable THC level. Um, there's provisions for um, requiring corrective action plans, and all of these things, um, we have statutory authority to address in Virginia already because it was included in those amendments made earlier this year. So I think that um, I'm hopeful that our plan that reflects our current law will um, be acceptable in USDA's review. USDA has also provided that states need to uh, um, have an annual inspection process. Um, that seems to be something different than sampling everything, um, and I think that USDA will come out with some um, clarification regarding the, distinct, the distinction they're making between annual inspection and sampling. USDA has also called on states to um, establish a procedure for submitting information to USDA. So states have to, um, state departments of ag have to submit month or monthly reports on registered growers, we have to submit a monthly report on um, the crops that have tested hot and the disposal records for those crops. We have to do an annual report on total acres planted, harvested, and disposed of, and we have to send test results to USDA. USDA's um, rule reflects the farm bill that states that seek this primary regulatory authority over hemp production um, have to certify that the state has the resources to do what the state lays out that it will do in its plan. And then USDA's, um, finally USDA's rule requires that states share information, um, have a process to share information with USDA. Um, one piece thing of note in this rule is that um, the USDA's rule requires that growers um, report their hemp crop acreage to USDA's Farm Service Agency. Um, that's something that many farmers already do in the course of their um, ag operations, but that will be something um, likely you knew for um, growers who weren't already interacting um, with FSA. At this point, VDAX has drafted a hemp production regulation plan. Um, it's currently under review by Virginia State Police and the Governor's Office. That review is required by the Farm Bill. Um, we are hopeful that we will have um, a plan, an approved plan, ready to submit to USDA by the end of the year. Um, USDA then has 60 days to act on the plan. Um, our hope is that um, US, we'll get USDA's feedback um, in time to make any adjustments to the, the Virginia industrial hemp law um, that might be necessary to respond to any concerns that USDA has with our plan. Um, so our, our general assembly session will run until from the beginning of January till the beginning of March of 2020. Um, so if we get the plan, our plan submitted by the end of this month, um, that should give us enough time to respond to um, any feedback we get from USDA. I um, can move into food safety, um, top, the food safety issue, but if there's any questions about the USDA interim final rule and where Virginia is with that, I'd be happy to pause and answer those questions now. No? Nope. Okay. I will um, 
and quickly walk through uh, uh, where. There yeah. is one uh, question in the chat. I don't know if you can see that. Um, no, can you please clarify that. that you can sell Virginia grown hemp to regular unlicensed people in a retail setting as long as you process it into a finished product? If what is being sold is a hemp product, so it's a finished product that's otherwise lawful that contains industrial hemp and has no greater than 0.3% THC, that product um, can be sold to whomever. Re that person does not need to have a registration. Um, to kind of drill down farther and to follow up on the next question that just came in, um, the question related to whether a farmer can sell flour to a retailer or to the consumer. Um, as VDAX interprets the industrial hemp law and Virginia's criminal code, we do not think that that um, plant material can be in the possession of somebody who does not have a registration. So growers should not be selling to someone who does not have a registration because without that registration that cannabis is marijuana as far as Virginia's criminal code is concerned. That being said, ultimately the criminal code is, is um, law enforcement, Commonwealth Attorney's law to interpret and enforce. Um, so that's uh, how VDAX reads the law, but it's not our law um, to um, require compliance with. Let's see, processor. So there's a statement about needing a processor's license to trim and process flour into a smokable product. Um, to possess that flour, you would need to have some kind of registration. Um, I, there is no, um, it, it's not clear from the law that trimming, drying, trimming, turns the plant material into a finished product. It's, the, the law just doesn't kind of, doesn't provide any more clarity as to what a finished product is um, other than just a statement that it's a finished product. So again, I think we, we get back to if, the, if that plant material, uh, flower, microgreens, viable planting seed, um, if we're talking about those three parts of the plant, those parts need to be in the possession of somebody who has an industrial hemp registration or uh, somebody who's registered, an agent of somebody who's registered. Okay, so I see another question about compliance and negligence. If a farmer produces compliant hemp and is transporting that hemp and is seized by law enforcement, how does law enforcement determine legality of the product? that automatically legal because it was grown compliant by a farmer? What if law enforcement tests it themselves and it's over 0.3? Um, that is kind of the tricky nature of this plant that a grower could test it and it um, and determines that the total THC is no greater than 0.3% um, and you know, harvest and transport and at the time of transport law enforcement um, test indicates that it's over 0.3. Um, I think having documentation of your due diligence as a grower will hopefully go a long way. Um, but it's, yeah, it's still, an, I recognize it's an area that's a, kind of a challenge across the country. All right, other questions before I guess hemp production questions before I get into food safety and processing questions. And I'll open it back up for questions once I get to the end too, if, if um, something comes up. Um, I Hi, will- Hi, Erin, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I had one quick question. So um, Becky and I were talking offline and you know, we're a testing lab. This is, we're a third party testing lab. And I was wondering how that impacts us because we're not, a processor, we're not a farmer, but we do possess hemp because obviously it's something we have to do in order to test it for farmers so that they can see that they're under that 0.3 level. So my suggestion for 
any labs that are um, taking possession of plant material is to obtain an agent documentation form from the, the growers or processors, well, the growers for whom you're sampling, or for, excuse me, for whom you're testing. Okay. All right. So the um, now I'm going to address very briefly um, the food safety related laws that the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services administers. So there's uh, there are other entities that do food safety inspections and, and regulate food safety, um, but I'm going to speak specifically about what um, VDAX regulates, and that's um, the manufacturer of um, our food manufacturers here in Virginia, as well as retail food establishments here in Virginia. Um, and the two primary bodies of law um, that um, impact this uh, are the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act and Virginia's Food and Drink Law. And kind of for the understanding of both of these pieces of law, um, food is a substance that's intended for human consumption that's orally ingested. And the general premise is that any substance intentionally added to food must be an approved food additive from an approved source. And there is a way to, um, there's a specific path to be becoming an approved food additive um, and an approved source. So it's approved by the Federal Food and Drug Administration or you're generally recognized as safe, that, that food product is generally recognized as safe by the FDA. So, so far FDA has issued GRAS notifications for hold, hemp seeds, hemp seed protein, and hemp seed oil. The, those, as far as FDA uh, is concerned, are the only approved food additives coming from the hemp plant. There's also an, a specific process to become an approved source, and essentially um, the entity is under inspection by the Food Regulatory Authority in their state. So in, v in Virginia's VDAX, either FDA or if you're in another state, it's the food program in the other state. Uh, so when hemp products um, started hitting the market, we looked at the different products, and we're looking specifically at this point about hemp-derived extracts that are intended for human consumption. Um, and we have looked at both the a food product to which a hemp-derived oil is added or just the oil itself that contains an extract that's intended for human consumption. And you can see here uh, the different pieces or components that would, are, would be considered a food additive and would need to be approved. And again, FDA at this point has said, has identified three approved food additives, none of which are hemp-derived um, cannabinoids or extracts or oils containing the extracts. Um, the, for that reason, we, VDAX initially um, came to the determination that its food safety program could not inspect um, industrial hemp processors who were producing, who planned to manufacture a hemp-derived extract intended for human consumption because Virginia's food laws very closely mirror the federal food laws. Um, and we came to the same place that FDA has because of um, how the program operates. So we were not able to inspect these manufacturers or these processors who would be manufacturers of food. Therefore, um, the products would not be compliant with um, Virginia's food and drink law. Um, however, given that we expect um, FDA's um, regulatory response to or, or regulation of hemp-derived extracts intended for human consumption will take a while, um, given the significant amount of conversation that occurred during the 2019 session about hemp-derived products intended for human consumption. Um, the Governor Northam directed VDAX to um, treat hemp-derived extracts intended for human consumption as approved food additives and to place qualifying registered industrial hemp processors 
under food safety inspection um, so that entities that are inspected and approved can manufacture hemp-derived extracts intended for human consumption here um, in Virginia. To, uh, following the Governor Northam's um, directive, the food safety program um, came up with um, a process and came up with some um, guidelines for registered industrial hemp processors who were going to manufacture um, an extract intended for human consumption. And essentially, um, all the details of that, those standards are available on VDEX's website. Um, but a manufacturer would need to comply with good manufacturing practice requirements. Their extracts would need to be produced with hemp that's grown in compliance with state or federal law. The extracts may have no more than 0.3% THC, and then there's some specific standards for heavy metals, mycotoxins, microbiologicals, um, residual solvents, and, and pesticides. Um, the, again, the, that information is available on both the hemp program's webpage as well as the food safety program's webpage. Food safety has also um, created um, an application specific to manufacturers of hemp derived extracts intended for human consumption. Um, so far, we, the guidelines were issued this summer, mid-summer, um, and so far the um, food safety program has placed two industrial hemp um, processors under food safety inspection. So that kind of briefly talks about both Feed Access Hemp Program and our food safety program's response to these new products that are um, on the market. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you've got now or we can do questions later. Kyle's going to give you some um, information specific to Agribusiness Council's efforts to um, get this legislation passed in 2019 and um, what their members are experiencing with the market now. Um, so if there's no questions, I'll pass, pass it to Kyle. Erin? Yes. Hi, this is Elizabeth Melson. Um, I do have a question about uh, the food manufacturing. Um, mm -hmm. We grow on a restaurant property, so we are technically inspected, you know, as safe to produce food through the, the local health department. Um, okay. Would we then initial, uh, you know, additionally need to fill out um, the paperwork through VDAX for our food products? So it may be that um, VDAX's food safety program doesn't have jurisdiction over the activity that's occurring at the restaurant. And um, as you noted, restaurants are under health department jurisdiction and they Health, Department of Health did not receive a similar directive, so they do treat hemp-derived extracts differently um, than VDEX. So I would start the conversation with your local health inspector and determine whether it's appropriate for VDEX's food safety program to um, uh, review the process that's happening. Um, the food safety, both VDEX's food safety and Department of Health are kind of better better position than I am to look at the activity and determine who needs to inspect what. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh Thanks, this is Kyle. Uh, hey, Aaron, uh, would you mind? Um, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kyle Shreve. I'm the Executive Director of the Virginia Agribusiness Council. As Aaron said, uh, I'm going to walk you through um, some of this. I, I gave a lot of the information that, that Aaron shared at the annual meeting, and I was, I was happy to be there, and we, we did kind of run out of time. So I, I'm more than happy to come back. I'm going to focus, since Aaron 
uh, was able to walk you through the current regulatory structure. I'm going to walk you through kind of the timeline from the Agribusiness Council's perspective uh, and let you know what some of our current um, positions and, and government affairs activities are. Uh, and then walk you through a little bit about how the market is going and um, uh, what as a market manager, a producer, a uh, supplier uh, you might need in order to uh, continue uh, to supply hemp and hemp derived products to market. Uh, and so, um, uh, a little bit about the, the council in case you're not familiar. We were formed in 1971. Uh, but our roots go back to the Agricultural Conference Board of Virginia. Um, and our mission uh, that our full-time staff uh, give here is to be the unified voice of agribusiness uh, in the Commonwealth. We have agriculture entities, farmers, uh, producers, processors, suppliers, uh, all the way down the supply chain in both the agriculture, forestry, landscaping, nursery industries, all the way down the line. If it touches agriculture or the ground, uh, or forestry in the Commonwealth, uh, we represent you uh, both at the General Assembly and in, in Washington. Uh, we have work a lot with our industry partners, including Farm Bureau, uh, the uh, Virginia Forestry Association, uh, Poultry Federation, Dairymen's, Cattlemen's, all the way down the line, uh, Nursery and Landscape Association, uh, in order to make sure that uh, we are based here in Richmond uh, in order to keep an eye on things so that you as business owners don't have to. Uh, and again, this is our mission uh, and our values uh, that we try to speak uh, for everyone on down the line. And hemp certainly falls underneath that category as uh, a new uh, cash crop uh, for Virginia's producers. Uh, so as Aaron said, you know, House Bill 1839 and Senate Bill 1692 kind of came about after the passage of the uh, 2018 Farm Bill. Uh, we supported those bills along with our partners like Virginia Farm Bureau, the Industrial Hemp Coalition. We had a pretty uh, wide range of uh, in, uh, organizations uh, get behind it. Um, it was not uh, without controversy. Virginia has been a, a historically um, uh, law enforcement, uh, pro-law enforcement state when it comes to controlled substances. Um, we had to answer a lot of questions, uh, uh, specifically around that word dealing. Uh, the, the bill was based on uh, the tobacco uh, law and the commercial growing, dealing, and processing of hemp registrations came out of that. And uh, a lot of legislators, legislators had questions about what is exactly hemp dealing. Uh, it sounds an awful lot like drug dealing. So we had to answer a, a lot of those questions just saying, no, we are just putting what is passed on the, farm, uh, the 2018 Farm Bill uh, on the books. Um, Growers, dealers, and processors must register with VDACs, as Aaron covered, um, and we wanted to make sure that uh, that we were as close to Farm Bill compliant as possible so that uh, our state action plan, uh, which uh, the council supports, Virginia taking ownership of the industrial hemp uh, rule, uh, is uh, as close as it can be to federal law so that we have a better chance of getting that approved by USDA when Virginia ultimately uh, uh, does submit it. Uh, we worked early and often with law enforcement agencies. I don't know if anyone saw the recent article uh, that came out of the Bristol uh, News Courier. Uh, they interviewed uh, law enforcement agencies in both Tennessee and Virginia, and the, the contrast was stark. Tennessee is, was struggling to enforce its hemp bill, and uh, they interviewed a few southwest counties and law enforcement, and they were all aware of it. Uh, they said we have testing procedures in place. We know it's it's coming, and um, we have we don't see any problems with it, uh, which we very much appreciate. It is something that we uh, absolutely see as a partnership. And as Aaron said, we need to have the state action plan approved by the chief law enforcement agency uh, in Virginia. And so we wanted to ensure that uh, they were ready to enforce the new law uh, once it was enacted. Uh, it needed, as I said, needed to be as close as it could. Need, the definitions needed to mirror up so that we did not uh, run afoul of federal law. Um, that is becoming a, a bigger and bit, bigger issue. And as Aaron said, and this is the biggest question we get from legislators, the industry, all the way down the line, um, the THC level is the key factor in determining whether something is industrial hemp in the eyes of the law or marijuana. And 
I've gotten a lot of questions about, well, is CBD concentration, you know, is there any limit on that? Um, currently, the Farm Bill distinguishes industrial hemp as 0.3% or below THC level, uh, and above that uh, is, is not industrial hemp. And so um, there is uh, no limit right now on on uh, CBD, and um, there is, as Aaron mentioned, there is some uh, uh, differing of opinions on what exactly is a hemp-derived product um, and how much processing has to go into it in order for it to be a hemp-derived product. But the Farm Bill very clearly states that the transport of hemp and hemp products is not to be abridged by any state. Uh, and so a very big argument that we had during the General Assembly session is, is that these products are going to be coming in from outside the state anyway. And so Virginia needed to be ready uh, to uh, and have a regulatory structure in place to not only uh, allow us to regulate uh, those uh, um, products coming in, but that uh, why then are we uh, hampering or uh, deterring uh, Virginia's producers and processors uh, from taking advantage of the demand in the market uh, for industrial hemp products, uh, which I'll get into here in a minute. Um, as Aaron kind of went through, the you know FDA starts the process currently under law uh, right now, and we are uh, because FDA has been slow, uh, so slow to move uh, in approving these products or even taking a position on uh, hemp-derived products. Um, we we felt it very necessary that Virginia start to put its own regulatory uh, product in place. Uh, as Aaron said, the, the commissioner sent a letter to uh, to producers and, and processors stating that um, that they would not be able to approve under Virginia law, um, which was a, a it, it was a, a interpretation of federal law that was not without merit. Uh, we agree that it is very difficult to determine uh, where that regulatory process uh, should start. However, as I said, the, the products were already coming into the Commonwealth, and so not moving ahead or waiting for FDA, which tends to move very, very slowly, uh, did not uh, for us to uh, seem uh, to be a, a proper uh, uh, way forward. Um, we did supply comments back to, to VDAX on, on the initial letter. I know uh, many in the industry did. And uh, as, as Aaron covered, uh, the Northern Administration directed uh, VDAX, uh, they issued guidelines, uh, in which we fully supported, uh, to treat it as FDA approved until uh, the federal government acts. Um, and as I said, that uh, our, our position was they should have the authority to treat any hemp, hemp product intended for human consumption as an uh, approved food ingredient or dietary supplement. Um, and really, this this stems. Uh, there were a lot of concerns during the 2019 General Assembly session that um, uh, that there may be confusion uh, between hemp products and products uh, produced for met medicinal purposes. Virginia does have a uh, medicinal CBD program that is administered by the Board of Pharmacy, and so. Um, we absolutely wanted to make sure that VDAX was the primary regulatory agency for industrial hemp products and that the Board of Pharmacy uh, regulated products intended for medicinal uses um, as intended by the General Assembly as, as we went forward. Um, as Aaron mentioned, the joint work group recommendation did come out as to how to go forward uh, in trying to sort out the differences in, in regulatory structure for uh, hemp-derived products when it came to uh, when it came to CBD oils especially. Um, and so uh, we were very pleased that that work group recommended uh, via legislation primarily and some regulatory uh, 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 some regulatory changes that it, it mirrored very much what the commissioner's guidelines had already stated in her letter of July 15th. And so uh, we were pleased that that was going to be the recommendations we do expect um, some form of legislation uh, to come about to try to uh, mirror those guidelines and make sure that Virginia's code uh, um, uh, is, uh, allows for uh, those guidelines to be enforced uh, during the 2020 General Assembly session. Uh, some of our producer members have been um, if, if asked us uh, at the council, uh, you know, those are pretty strict. Where did, uh, you know, the 0.3% uh, 
uh, limit seems to be very restrictive, and it is, but all that stems from the Farm Bill. And again, so that we make sure that uh, this product is available and uh, producers are able to uh, enjoy the market and continue to uh, produce it going forward, uh, we need to make sure that we are complying with all federal laws uh, and that um, and that we don't allow consumer confusion with some of those products. We want to make sure they are uh, kept separate and regulated appropriately uh, for use. As Aaron went through the USDA interim final rule, I'm not going to go through the details of each one, but we do have a major concern and uh, uh, several major concerns with USDA's rule uh, currently. Uh, every crop must be tested before being put to market, as Aaron said, is, is going to be very difficult to enforce. And all of these I kind of look at as if, if you think about the supply chain and, and how hemp products are, are marketed, each one of these kind of builds on another uh, to create an unworkable system. Uh, Fifteen days before harvest time is not enough time, uh, especially if every crop has to be tested. And so it's going to be very difficult for the staff at VDAX to go out and sample every crop uh, in order to um, – uh, and in the 15 days required, that product cannot be harvested in that 15 uh, days until you get the testing sample uh, back. Um, you must use a DEA registered facility uh, for those tests. Uh, it has to be in the state action plan. We currently only have two in Virginia. And so those testing centers are going to be very overwhelmed. It's going to create a backlog, uh, especially in a 15-day time period in which you have to send samples from every crop. And um, we, we they mentioned earlier uh, about the law enforcement, the, the Farm Bill provides for a 5% negligent threshold to be established. We think that's too low, uh, knowing the swings of THC levels that can swing at any given time of the process at different ends of the field. Um, we would like to see that at least 1% or higher uh, for the uh, uh, for a negligence threshold, and then the cost of the program. Uh, as I said, as each one of these things uh, kind of build on one another, the costs are going to mount. And so enforcement costs are a very big deal when it comes to the state budget uh, or in the form as our chief concerns are going to be uh, uh, that those costs would be passed on to producers and become a barrier into the market. Uh, our recommendations are going to be more of a risk and hazard approach, such as we do with food safety, a certain percentage of the crop uh, throughout Virginia. If a producer knows that testing is possible every year, they're going to keep the 0.3% threshold in mind. Uh, and so uh, that will take a lot of the stress off of VDAX for sampling. Uh, a 30, day, uh, turn, um, 30 days prior to harvest rather than 15 will give us uh, those two extra weeks. Uh, to try to get those tests in. Allow testing in a non-DEA registered testing facility. Um, I understand why they did that. Uh, the national law enforcement community is, is very concerned um, about this and uh, they wanted to keep, uh, I believe they wanted to keep chain of custody uh, at a DEA, DEA registered facility. However, that becomes very unworkable uh, for the industry and also becomes very expensive uh, for the industry. Um, as I mentioned, we would like to see an increase in the negligent threshold, and then uh, we would also like to see funding for USDA and states to help with state action plan enforcement. Uh, Aaron didn't really get into this, but as uh, USDA is re the responsible regulatory agency for any state that does not provide uh, a state action plan so that those states are not left out. And so... Uh, I'm not sure how many states are planning on submitting a state action plan, but uh, one would assume that USDA is going to need some extra funding to create an office to administer this program uh, for states that do not take primary, primary responsibility. We would like to see Virginia take primary responsibility uh, because Virginia's uh, hemp program uh, should be different than those in larger states out west. Uh, however, uh, we want to make sure that it doesn't overburden uh, either the state budget or the uh, industry in the form of registration fees, if we can all help it. Uh, so what have we done? Uh, the comment period, I would advise everybody on the rule ends December 30th. Uh, so anyone in the industry uh, may submit comment to USDA uh, on those points or any points contained in the final rule and the interim final rule. Um, we, are, we do expect to uh, submit comment largely based on the points that I made earlier. 
And uh, we have also reached out. I've sent uh, an email to every single congressional delegation asking them to weigh in uh, for their uh, for our, our legislators in the U.S. Congress. Um, we've also encouraged all our important organizations that we work with that have an interest in hemp to weigh in as well, and I'm sure they will. Uh, I know that uh, I, I can't imagine the Industrial Hemp Coalition uh, won't weigh in at some point on uh, giving their uh, uh, their perspective on USDA's role, and that they should. Uh, uh, it, it is going to be very restrictive for the market, not just in Virginia, but nationwide. Um, so going back to some of these, I'm going to transition into a little bit of uh, the market here in Virginia, um, and then we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll take some questions uh, afterwards. But as, as Aaron mentioned, I wanted to go back to this slide because uh, during VDAX's initial registration period, they asked for planned acres of crops. And in their initial reports that came back, it was there was over 10,000 acres that were originally planned to be planted with hemp. Um, as Aaron reported uh, just a little bit ago, um, actual crop reports coming back in shows about 2,200 acres uh, planted in Virginia for 2019. That's not a coincidence. Um, there are uh, there's an awful lot of uncertainty. I'll go into some of what some of the challenges are in planting hemp. Um, but I think for the most part, people saw dollar signs when this first became legal, legalized. And then once they got into the actual what goes in uh, to being a hemp producer, they scaled back uh, quite a bit. And that's, uh, that is absolutely not uh, unexpected uh, when it comes to, to hemp production uh, in Virginia. So the market continues to be a big driver. Uh, in 2018, the national crop, crop estimates show 77,000 acres of hemp was planted in the U.S. Uh, CBD products continue to be the market driver of that. Um, we'll see if that lasts. I know that uh, more and more attention is being turned to biomass um, for, for sales, but um, it'll probably be a little bit of both going forward. Uh, last year, retail sales of CBD products were estimated between $600 million and $2 billion. That's from Cohen uh, 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 Market uh, in New York, and estimated to reach $16 billion by 2025, uh, by the latest numbers. We will see if those numbers are realized uh, as it continues to grow or if it tapers off a little. Um, but that's the reason why there is so much interest in this product. Um, especially in areas of southwest, south side, uh, and uh, uh, on the western half of the Commonwealth. So as I said, there are several challenges whoops, uh, as to why uh, people kind of pulled back a little bit. It is very expensive to plant. Depending on who you're working with and who you're selling to, what kind of clones you're putting in, what variety, um, it can differ. But uh, for someone, a producer that has not grown it in the past, it is pretty expensive to put in. Uh, crop insurance has been a huge issue. Um, there is a pilot program uh, right now that a private crop insurance provider has done. We, we worked very hard, uh, and by we, I mean the industry. It was a very much a group effort to try to get hemp included in that pilot. It was. Uh, however, uh, to this day, I have not seen an approved crop insurance plan. I know the proposal has been submitted, but I do not believe it has been approved yet. And so it makes it very difficult without crop insurance. The other big question that we had with USDA is if that 0.3% threshold, it goes above and the crop ends up being ordered destroyed, are you still eligible for crop insurance? And the message we got back was it is not likely uh, because then it would be a controlled substance and it's very difficult to justify spending uh, crop insurance dollars on a product that is technically an illegal substance. Pests and lack of pesticide knowledge and approval. This, this came out of uh, the fact that we're growing something that in, in Virginia that had not been grown before, and we are seeing a number of pests that we were not in, uh, intending. Uh, I know Virginia, I was at the Virginia Tech AREC uh, uh, in southern Piedmont uh, a few months ago, and they were saying that they are actually seeing, because of the thickness of the stock, uh, termites. Uh, it, it's actually acting more... Um, uh, more as a tree than it is a plant. And that was not expected. And so 
this is going to continue to be a learning process. I will give a shout out to our friends at Virginia Tech and VSU uh, and Cooperative Extension. They are working like crazy trying to get our producers uh, enough data and enough knowledge uh, to be able to successfully grow this without the plant falling over. Or other. And, and those in the processing industry, depending on who you're uh, who you're working with and who the processor is uh, that is making the product, um, they should be able to share some knowledge with you as well about what they've experienced in other states, um, especially if they're pretty established. Um, we do have a, a lack of market data as to where those products are going to go, how uh, the sales data is going to continue to grow in Virginia, um, so that uh, and what varieties are best um, when it comes to those products, uh, which makes it uh, a heck of a lot riskier for a Virginia producer to enter the market. And then, of course, as we've kind of talked about, if you haven't gotten the sense yet, it's kind of the Wild West uh, with the uh, regulatory environment. We are not sure where things are going to shake out. We didn't uh, uh, at the beginning. This is, again, this is expected. Uh, whenever you're taking something and changing it and creating a new regulatory structure, there are going to be hiccups. There are going to be things that are just unclear, um, which is why, you know, uh, the, the, the restaurant question was a great one as you're going through it, because that stuff that is going to be worked out oftentimes messily. And which is the reason why we wanted a work group between the HHR Secretariat and the Agriculture and Forestry uh, Secretariat to sit down and try to think of those contingencies ahead of time uh, so that we could plan for them uh, without, uh, without too many speed bumps in the road. But obviously, we're going to continue to hit them both at the federal level and the state level as we go forward. If you are going to grow and sell hemp, then I will try to, to – uh, I'm going to throw in some things at the end for, for farmers markets uh, that, you know, I know they operate a little differently than some others uh, that, and stuff for the, if you are a market manager, a seller or a grower uh, supplying to a farmers market. But um, know your market and your processor. If you're going to start growing this, um, it, it, it's very difficult to figure out. One of the things, reasons why I think acreage pulled back was people started growing it without having a place to send it. And so make sure you know where you're sending that crop before you put it in the ground. If you are going to process it yourself, if you're going to sell it in a, at a farmer's market, uh, if you're going to make sure that you have the resources and the ability to process it into the product that you would like, um, or have an arrangement with a processor, again, uh, that, that's going to, or a dealer, know where it's going to go and how it's going to come back. Um, the more and more you have on that, the more and more uh, sound you're going to be, the less risk you're going to take. VDAX now has, and this has been a question we have had going back to the bill, on their website, a dealer and processor list that have approved um, them to share uh, the information. You can go on there now and find it. I, I did it yesterday. Um, for processors that are looking for producers that are growing it, um, that has also been a, a point of concern where you want somebody to have the market information that they can to reach out to producers. And some producers want uh, processors to reach out to them. They want those opportunities and, and people competing for their business. Some of them already have a contract and don't necessarily want those folks to know who their, their contract is. And it becomes a privacy information uh, uh, problem. And so we've worked with VDAX to try to give processors um, maps and, you know, general areas of where uh, producers are located in order for them to go, then go out and try to uh, find producers to contract with um, while also preserving the privacy of, of farmers' uh, information. Um, but the dealer and processor list is on there uh, if, if you want to look. Uh, be prepared for testing at all levels. Like we said, we cannot cannot get around testing, um, especially for finished products. Um, you know, we want to be treated as any other food product is. And so for heavy metals testing, uh, to make sure that you are tested for exactly what it is that um, you say it is, make sure your pre product is properly lab labeled. FDA, as I said, has been slow in enforcing this, but the one thing they have enforced is that if you are marketing your product as having uh, medicinal purposes or properties, and it is not, and there are no THC levels, it's industrial hem, they will send you a letter of warning and they will start to go after you. Uh, it, you know, that is not to say, um, it, it, again, this goes back to the those lines that go in between um, Board of Pharmacy and medical purposes versus VDAX and, and, and agricultural production. 
Um, we want to make sure that what you are telling is in the product uh, is in there. And then, as I said, those uh, labeling guidelines uh, will be coming out, and we will likely see legislation to codify it, um, saying how much THC level will be on there, et cetera, uh, for uh, the purposes of selling your product. Work with Extension. And Tech and, and VSU have excellent industrial hemp programs um, that uh, each complete a field day uh, every year they are trying to, as, as the demand for those services have increased, I know they are shifting a lot of resources that way. And so don't don't be shy to reach out to your local extension office, and they can help you walk through both the growing and 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 uh, processing ends of the product. And again, register with VDAX. Uh, VDAX is um, again we're sorting out a lot of this as we go. And so if you are processing it, if you are a, a dealer, basically the middleman that's that's buying from farmers and, and transporting the processors, um, please let us uh, let let VDAX know what you're uh, what you're doing. Uh, and so um, uh, we'll we'll do that. Uh, we'll we'll try to get it in as as much as possible. Work through those problems as much as possible between industry and VDEX. We want to be helpful with them and uh, help make sure that the market works for everybody going forward. Uh, with that, I do have uh, several questions um, that I see have popped up. And uh, if you bear with me, the chat screen just uh, disappeared on me. There we go. Uh, so, um, total THC or Delta-9, this has been something that um, uh, we have talked about extensively with VDAX. I would say we're just, we just don't know yet, um, and Aaron might have uh, uh, more information than I do now. What we have asked for is that um, you, can, you can make a distinction between Delta-9 during the testing process and what you base your THC level, it would be much easier just to, for Delta-9 THC levels to be considered under 0.3, which we've advocated for. However, on labeling, uh, if you put label on total THC and Delta-9 THC and try to make that distinction on your product label, uh, it's the council's position that's just going to cause confu consumer confusion uh, and because no one's going to know the distinction of what that means. And so, um, it's something we're still working out through the regulatory process. As you know, it, it, like I said, a lot of this we just don't know yet. It hasn't been decided. Uh, what do I mean Kyle, by Kyle, I'll yeah. add to that for um, the purpose of um, determining whether a hemp crop is compliant with the law, VDAX is looking at the total THC of the crop, which is um, the Delta-9 post-decarboxylation. Okay. Uh, the next question from David King, uh, what do you mean by not abridged by any state? There was a provision in the 2018 Farm Bill that said states may not affear, interfere with the transportation of hemp or hemp products across state lines. Uh, it is an inaction uh, meant to get around the Commerce Clause in the Constitution in which um, the federal government gets to be the ultimate decider about interstate commerce. Um, and so when they put that provision in there, it said that states could not prevent uh, hemp and hemp products from, from crossing state lines. Um, now, you can regulate that once it comes into your, but you couldn't outright ban the stop of it. Uh, and, and that provision was included in the 2018 Farm Bill. Uh, uh, I'll take the next one. Kyle. Yeah, if you would um, mind. Yeah, the, um, so if, if you are a registered grower, you do need to submit a planting report. Um, there's a section on that planting report. If you did not plant, you indicate that you did not plant. But we, do, we did need to get a report from you. Um, for 2019, um, uh, we asked for the reports to be in, I think it was by the end of July. Um, and we'll likely do something um, similar in 2020. The, um, you do need to reapply for your registration. It's the, your registration, whether it's grower, processor, or dealer, is good for one year um, from the date um, that we issue it. You do need to reapply. Um, I'll say now plan for, um, to get your application, your renewal application in 60 days before your registration expires. If you want to change um, 
the address of your, you know, change your production field, you can do that. Um, if you already have a registration and determine, um, you know, in March of this year or March of next year that you're going to, your field's going to be somewhere else, there is a change request form that's available on our webpage um, that you use to um, indicate to us what field you're going to pull off your registration and, and give us the information we need about the field you're adding. Um, or if, if you're simply just adding more fields, th that's fine. You use that same form to do, um, to do that as well. Um, if you are just growing a few plants and you don't plan to sell it, you do have to report it. Uh, again, we are um, looking at the production of hemp in Virginia and it, not making a distinction between whether that crop is moving to uh, to market or is used for personal consumption. Our law doesn't um, distinguish between it. It's, it's, it's really uh, we're tasked with regulating the, the production of the crop. And so, yes, if you're just looking at a few plants, do submit a planting report um, for those few plants. One, one other thing I, that I was asked at the annual meeting that was a, a great question from uh, if you are a market manager. Uh, what documentation do you need to have uh, in order to, uh, you know, allow a CBD uh, seller, processor, farmer, whoever to sell? Um, uh, you know, it, it, again, like Eric said, you know, selling it, reselling it, you don't have to have one. But if you have a processor that is selling directly, um, then you know, you may want to think about requiring uh, to have a copy of their registration on file yearly to make sure they are following all uh, uh, rules and regulations of, of VDACs. Again, uh, where you want to try to protect yourself uh, from is who's who's selling at that market uh, and, and where is it coming from as much as possible to have on file uh, in case there is an instance of um, somebody, uh, you know, getting sick, what have you, on, you know, through there uh, in order to limit your liability. Now, you know, most of the time that liability is going to fall back on who's ever selling it. But, um, you know, if BDAX does come around as they do to inspect other types of food products at farmers markets, um, then you want to make sure that you uh, have all the requisite uh, information and paperwork on file uh, in order to make sure you're protected. Um, but I think that's, for at least the time being, going to be an individual market choice. Uh, as far as how you're governed and, and how much information you require for your vendors. Uh, Aaron, I'm going to let you take that one too. Yeah. So if you, in responding to the question that what, what do you report if you were registered in August and you haven't grown, um, don't worry about reporting anything now. It will look for planting reports um, in the next growing season unless you uh, plant something between now and um, uh, the – so if you're using a, a greenhouse and you're going to plant over the winter, um, as soon as you plant, you do need to submit the planting report. Um, but if you're – you have, if you're registered with a plan to do a um, outdoor grow in the spring, you would just submit a planting report at the time that you plant your fields. Are there any other questions for Kyle or Aaron? No? Well, then I would like to thank everybody for joining us today. Kyle, Aaron, this has been so informative. We so appreciate your giving us your time and expertise and knowledge, um, sharing the information that you have today. I will ask if you haven't done so to please send to Mary Delicate the presentation so that we can put it up on our website with the recording for folks to go back and to access. And, um, one last call out. Any other questions? Nope. Well, then with that, we will say thank you very much for the presentation today. I appreciate everybody participating and have a good holiday. Thank you. Thank you.